Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for Magic is Real. I'm Shannon. I'm your host. This is the podcast where we talk about all things spiritual and metaphysical with a focus on near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative experiences. If you like this podcast or you like this episode, would you do me a favor and please like, subscribe, share, comment below. It really helps to the podcast to grow and it's a way to support the podcast for free. With that being said, I am very happy to have with me today Dr. Kim, who is a licensed therapist in California and she is a uh she's an author of two books about dreams and a dream worker and has so much knowledge about the spiritual world, but today our focus is going to be on dreams and spirituality and how they combine. So Dr. Kim, thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks for having me on, Shannon. It's such a pleasure. We met at the International Association for Near-Death Studies Conference in Phoenix, and it was such a wonderful time, and it was so much fun to hang out with you. And we talked, and I was so interested in the work that you're doing. You're doing so many different things, but I would like for you to share from your heart in your words, what it is that you do professionally. Sure. And it, it was it was so great to meet you at the IONS conference. It was my first one. And Thank you. Uh, what a wonderful community. I really look Thank forward God. to going to the next one. And as far as professionally, I, uh, as you said, I'm a licensed therapist in the state of California. And I think of myself as a holistic therapist because I'm trained in, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and um, know um, a bit about psychodynamics. And I'm also oriented as a, as a humanistic therapist, but I bring to the table a spiritual perspective as well. So I think about our uh, somatic, you know, I've had training in somatics uh, in my doctoral program. So I think about the body, I think about uh, spirit and how all of this comes together in our, you know, day-to-day -day lives, how we walk through the world. So that's why I call myself a holistic psychotherapist a lot, just so that it's clear that we're looking at our whole selves. It's more than just what we think or what we, how we behave, what we do. It's also how we feel, how we relate to others, how um, we are um, with spirit. And so that's my professional role and other roles. I'm uh, a sister and a daughter, a dog mom. I'm also a Tia, as they call me. So an auntie to two wonderful nephews and a cousin to many. And so I, I really think of relational uh, qualities in my psychotherapy as well. So it's also very relational based. Then I write and I teach. So I stay pretty busy. That's, um, I guess what I do on a professional side. Yeah. And um, I love the outdoors. I love nature, time with with animals. So arts, the arts as well. I do I do quite a bit. Uh, I enjoy so many things, you know, that yeah. is offered in in this physical body in this lifetime, all the things we can do. So so me too. Uh, me too. There's so that's, much. That's our enjoy. sensitive nature and our empathic mm -hmm. nature to just be drawn to all things beautiful and connected and love oriented. Uh, so yeah, I would, so first of all, we're going to have links to your, your, uh, all your stuff. Tell Thank me you. the names of your books about dreams that you have written and published first sure. of all. So the first one came out of my doctoral dissertation and that book is published by McFarland called Extraordinary Dreams, Visions, Announcements, and Premonition Across Time and Place. And so, as I said, that book really emerged from my doctoral work, which was on announcing dreams of pregnant women, primarily, uh, even though announcing dreams do happen to fathers and other family and community members, their research was geared toward women that were already pregnant and the dreams that they remembered and that impacted them during pregnancy that had to do with a pre-birth communication, as we call it, something where the dreamer, in this case, the pregnant mother and the child to be is having some kind of communication. And so that drove that first book. 
But I was also very interested in visitation dreams or dreaming with uh, deceased loved ones. And that also appears pretty strongly in the book as well. So it's like ex the book Extraordinary Dreams is like these two bookends, you know, uh, pre-birth communication, after-death communication, and how that impacts us, you know, as, as people um, in this world, how we stay connected to those after they leave the physical body and can build relationships before a birth, before one fully comes in to the physical body as well. Because many announcing dreams happen even before conception. But for my study, um, we looked at just pregnant women that had uh, their pregnancy medically confirmed. So that's the first book. And then uh, the second one is on dream medicine. Uh, it's called dream medicine. And that's really what it's about. And the subtitle is the intersection of wellness and consciousness. And that is really different. Also by McFarland's imprint called Top Light Books. So that one is not maybe as heavy or academically, not it, it's written in APA style, you know, American Psychological Association style, uh, you know, as someone with a, a PhD in psychology, but it is a little more, uh, let's just say reader friendly. And that book was very interesting. I, I was starting to write again a little bit after Extraordinary Dreams was published and say, okay, you know what, what am I really writing about? And I was just writing things, but I didn't feel really inspired. And then all these dreams and synchronicities, uh, especially through the beginning and middle of 2019 were, were happening. And I didn't quite understand them, but I started to see I was getting dreams related to health. And then in 2019, not only did I get a breast cancer diagnosis and go, aha, that's what I'm writing for, you know, but I also then learned that um, I was in a, like adrenal fatigue. Uh, Dutch tests showed a flat cortisol line, which one physician told me she was more scared of that than the actual cancer diagnosis and other um, things that look at the gut, like Genovar or GI map tests can tell you, or they told me uh, that my, I had a, a really low score showing a gut dysbiosis. So this shocked me because I thought I was really healthy. I am a long time, you know, kind of like athlete, martial arts background, snowboarding, um, uh, dance. I mean, very active background, usually had a lot of energy, although around that time I did not. Um, thought I ate pretty healthy. But again, as my workload increased in those years, I again started to just eat eat more junk food because you're just trying to be quick and get by. Traveling distances for I because I was working in a few private practices, so it would be there's nothing around here. Just go get some fast food and eat it on the freeway as you continue to your next job. Um, that wasn't good, and the the test showed that. So. Here I am going, ah, that's what I'm writing this for. And uh, a spiritual friend that I respect very much in Arizona, one day I remember her saying to me, oh, dreaming, that that's your medicine. Uh, and she's a, a traditional, you know, I'll, I'll just say practitioner and psychologist, but of indigenous ways and that when she said that to me, I thought, ah, yeah, I always remember that. And they said, yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. And so that's how the book got that title and the subtitle, the intersection of consciousness and wellness came from all the dreams that I had before the diagnosis about a year's worth showing me something's going on with your health, showing me where the issues were in my body and that I need to you know, do something about it. And so I used dreaming, once I was diagnosed, I used dreaming to help me navigate. Also something really interesting that year too, was that I wanted to go to a retreat center in California called Esalen. I had never been there. So I signed up for a retreat and just kind of picked something that 
was convenient on my schedule, but also might have something to do with consciousness because I've, I'm a long time meditator and I found one on yoga nidra. So I went to that and learned the integrative Amrit method with Kamini Desai and John Vosler. And when I was done with, with that, I thought this was wonderful. You know, I'm learning about this other way, this sleep-based meditation that can actually propel you into lucid dreams at night, which we'll talk more about, I know. Yeah. Um, but then at the end of that training, it was in the beginning of 2019, I want to say April-ish. And I thought, this is close to hypnosis. I'm already certified in that. I don't need to learn this. But something got at me, you know, I always want a good deal. So they said, oh, but you're halfway through the training if you want to continue towards certification. And so I found that I was doing the homework. And then in September of 2019, I completed the certification going, Kim, what are you doing? You don't need another certification. But I, I liked it. It was another form of meditation that I found to be really easy. And then again, all of this taking place in 2019, the dreams, the synchronicities, the yoga nidra certification. So then in October, 2019, I get the breast cancer diagnosis. And it was like, I understand spirit creator. Thank you. I get it. I'm using yoga. I used yoga nidra for years. I still do, but for years, anytime anxiety flared up about the cancer diagnosis, I did a yoga nidra then felt really at peace for hours. It flare up again. I do another. So I started doing them about twice a day. And then again, synchronicities just kept happening. Things that were strange. Um, there were many, but that made me also go to the point I said earlier, this is why you're writing this book. You're, you ask spirit to te keep teaching you. And again, I, I do want to put a little disclaimer that this is my personal story. By no means am it anything I'm going to share today is by no means am I directing or suggesting what anyone else should do. By no means as my, my personal thoughts and feelings around what treatments I chose and didn't chose, none of that should be uh, borrowed or mapped onto someone else's experience. And again, this is my own personal experience. Um, so with that said, I can then share that the dreams guided me to do things where I then would go toward non-conventional, non-allopathic uh, wellness and healthcare for my treatment. So I've done, I have done zero conventional. Um, I will probably always do these integrative types of treatments forever. I'm at my five-year anniversary right now. And I just realized that if the, you know, and, and, and all the physicians I've worked with have reminded me, if your body builds tumors, you know, at this age, it might always do that. So you really have to have a different lifestyle and a different way of being in the world, eating, processing emotions, um, cause emotions and cancer are very much related. And so dream medicine, then finally, you know, I start, I start understanding why I'm writing at the end of 2019. And then that eventually comes out. And so it talks about all kinds of states of consciousness, meditation. Uh, I think I mentioned a little bit about um, journeying, what some call imaginal journeying or shamanic journeying, different names for a very a practice that's very similar. Um, and of course, dreams. And so that that really tells you what dream medicine is about. I share a lot of the dreams that I had in those years and share what I did and didn't do. And um, I'm hoping that, you know, is, you know, responsible for why uh, I'm doing well and sitting here talking about it today. So it was a pretty heavy book. <laughs> so yeah. A pretty heavy, heavy book. Um, and I continue to keep learning about wellness from a really holistic perspective how, how I treat my body, how I, um, think how I take responsibility for how I feel mm -hmm. my spiritual path, you know, has, it's been even more affirmed and, um, confirmed, you know, as I, as I move forward. Yeah. I, so that's a, that's, um, 
I was about to say in a nutshell, but that wasn't a nutshell. That that really gets yeah. into what that book is about. So thank really you well, me. really well told. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank it's you. really um I appreciate that. Uh PMH Atwater and I were talking today about how thoughts become things. And so, you know, it's yeah. not it's not stopping your thoughts, but it's just being aware of your thoughts and um kind of redirecting where we can without stuffing down feelings and avoiding them. We do want to acknowledge them, um, mm -hmm. but also being aware of how we interpret them and what, how, how we assign meaning to the thoughts because what we believe is what we will see. And so that's a whole other interesting topic. But uh, yeah, so let's really dive into dreams because I am very interested ever since I was can remember. And I remember being two years old very vividly because it was sort of an intense period of time. And I remember fl learning to fly in my dreams or having very lucid dreams, always dreamed in technicolor. So to me, uh, I, I have a really strong interest in dreams. So let's just start by, I mean, yes, there's a scientific explanation for dreams, but um, I think just we can start a, just anywhere you like about there were several things that we discussed that we would touch on um, in terms of how dreams are sort of a reflection of spirituality and can be spirit communication and um, soul uh, projections and, and those sorts of things. So just wherever you want to start, it's not really a question as much as just a launching pad for let's talk about dreams and spirituality. Sounds great. Uh, one of my favorite topics, as you know, yeah. and there's a few things. Yeah. I'd love to share. So I believe, um, as many, many, uh, cultures around the world do that there is, um, a connection between spirit creator and our dreaming. And that when we dream in essence, we're traveling, we're soul traveling. So dreaming is soul travel can be a way to kind of conceptualize or, or, or think about what's happening when our physical body is asleep. And we perhaps travel or soul travel every single night, even when we don't remember it. Now, we can be, we can have varying degrees of conscious awareness during these um let's just say uh, dream episodes where our spirit explores uh, different dimensions, different places. There's really no time and space in that dimension. And we know that from people who have uh, out of body experiences, why they're sleeping dreams, uh, con you know, lucid dreams. And we can explore those realms consciously some people do this naturally. I never did. I I had to take some pretty serious training, which involved lots and lots of meditation. The AM and PM, <laughs> lots of meditation and different types of meditation to really start to uh, learn what this, what consciousness, what my, what my soul or spirit what was going on here you know we know we're in these bodies we're supposed to be in these bodies you know we're supposed to feel them and feel our emotions and you know i that's why we we're put here but at the same time we can stay connected to something greater you know maybe where we came from uh babies you know sometimes share those types of stories with their mom while they're in utero or with their families or as we know from reincarnation studies, especially all the wonderful documentation from Ian Stevenson that toddlers sometimes remember lives that they had and can even direct you on how, um, I remember seeing a film by how children were pointing out, you know, how a jet, fighter jet planes were working or directing them to other areas of the country where their last family was. So if we believe the stack and stack stack of anecdotal evidence we see these patterns and i believe these truths that show we you know are greater than our bodies and we can train ourselves to grow our consciousness and take that with us as we sleep 
through lucid or conscious dreaming. And, and so I believe it's so important to keep a dream journal because we won't remember all this stuff. We think we will. And it's true that I've had some dreams that I can remember from 30 years ago because they were so powerful. However, the vast majority of things we will forget because that's just how memory is. Um, and so I really encourage people to keep a dream dictionary of not only they're just more mundane or everyday type of dream, but but all of them, you know, they're, they're most profound dreams, they're precognitive dreams. And we won't know often that they're precognitive unless we're tracking them. So I have learned that if we want to see or be shown how dreams actually can predict what's to come, we need to write them all down because usually it's the boring precognition that we're experiencing tiny things you know maybe it's uh we dream about something that came in our mailbox that was unexpected but it was so mundane we forgot about it and there a week later or a few days later or even a month later there it is and if we have a record of that in our dream dictionary we can remind ourselves no we're not crazy this this is how consciousness works it's not just reductionistic, mechanistic, you know, Cartesian cause and effect kind of reality we're in. We're in a reality so much greater that I think we've just scratched the surface on understanding it. Um, especially Western, you know, as someone trained in more Western science, we're, we're just scratching the surface. So we can do a lot with lucid dreaming, but we don't have to be lucid because there is a really cool practice where we can have dream relationships with ourselves in other ways through a practice called dream incubation. Are you, are you familiar with, with no. that? No, tell us all about it. Okay, so let me just take a sip of water here. Um, dream incubation, and there's, there's some other names for it, but it is essentially a practice where we ask for or call in a dream that we'd like to have for 101 different reasons. But what I did when I was writing dream medicine was to do my best to incubate dreams for health reasons. So the way I did it was I found a statement that I was going to use. And, and I want to share some examples because I think anyone listening can use this for manifesting all sorts of things. We want to keep statements in the positive and the affirmative. So I would say, ask open-ended questions as well. Like, show me what I need to know about my health. That's one example. Um, we don't want to ask what we don't want, or, you know, again, staying in the positive and affirmative uh, is really the best way to move forward, not just because um, cognitive psychology shows that's how we process information easiest, but because uh, in, you know, from, from various spiritual traditions, this seems to propel us forward in, in the best way. So again, I'll use the example, show me what I need to know about my body or show me what I can do this week for my health. And we can get real, even a little more specific about foods and things like that. So I'd find my statement, write it on a little scrap of paper or a little three by five card. I'd, I'd, uh, you know, practice my sleep hygiene practices and, and, and really pray or meditate on that statement or question before bed, put it under my pillow. And again, have the intention that I'm going to dream dream on this dream, dream, the, the solution or the guidance or answer, I dream it up. So then as I'm falling asleep, I'm thinking, you know, about, about this statement and we can address the, the dream, the stream source, some call it the dream maker. We can address this dream source in any way we want. We can, we can call out to whatever, spiritual or religious figure we believe in um, for this guidance because there's a consciousness there. So this is not a practice that is limited to any particular spirituality or religion or tradition. So that's what I would do. 
I would do what was meaningful to me with this positive or affirmative open-ended kind of statement or question. And then anytime I woke up middle of the night or early morning, I'd write down whatever it is I felt or remembered and then just wrote a dream title. So Robert Moss was a, a, a teacher of mine and hopefully I'll see him again. Uh, he's on the East Coast and he always reminded me is title your dream. So that's what I do now under his direction and guidance. And that itself, without thinking about it, can tell us a little bit of a hint. You know, why did we title our dream that? What might that be trying to show us? And sometimes mm -hmm. the responses I would get would be more metaphorical, symbolic, or vague. Other times it was nothing. And other times it was very straightforward and direct. So as I continue to incubate more dreams, I would ask them to give them to me straight up. Kind of like, um, do you work with tarot? Yes. Tar tarot cards? Okay. Or tarot. Um, how do you pronounce it? I've heard different pronunciations. Some people say tarot and I just say tarot, but I'm not necessarily yeah, tarot right. Or tarot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like, I know it's not tarot, but it's, <laughs> I've heard different ways of pronouncing yeah. it. So when, uh, I don't work with cards so much anymore, although I would like to get back into it, but I would tell my cards, I'm only going to, I don't read reversals. I'm only going to read you straight up. And, um, and, and ask them, remind them, <laughs> here's the relationship we've had on what these things mean yeah. through our time of working together and through sleeping with my cards and, and doing my daily, you know, uh, personal readings, sometimes just a four, a four card spread and reminding myself this, this is our agreement, you know? So I would do that with dreams as well and say, please show up in a very direct fashion, if you would. And if not, and I needed more information the next night, I would try to go back and say, let's continue that dream to give me a little more information in a way that I can understand it. It also helped to be part of a, um, of a almond method dream group for eight years. <laughs> so that helps me learn more about uh, a different frame of dreaming. So I learned about more metaphorical, archetypal, symbolic. And Dr. Stanley Krippner invited me to that many years ago. And so of course I went and I stayed with that group for eight years. It was in a Shirley McNeil's home, who's a, a really amazing hypnotist in the uh, Bay Area, in the San Francisco Bay Area at Berkeley. And it was in her home and from her and Stan Krippner and, and the participants, I, I learned so much about other ways to think about and interpret my dreams. But still, I always ask them, please dream maker, give it to me straight up direct. So when I got dreams after the cancer diagnosis, directly telling me to eat cauliflower, another one was collard greens. Those were the two vegetables that were very specific and direct, the most direct specific dreams about food. And so that's another thing we can do. We can you could look up a paper that Dr. Ed Kellogg wrote called the Dreamitarian Diet, super cool paper. And this talks about how you can incubate dreams for your diet, your personal diet. And Dr. Bhaskar Banerjee is also, who presented with me at IANS, the IANS okay. conference in, in Phoenix. And uh, he writes about, you know, and talks about this as well in his uh, teachings, he teaches and in his presentations. So that's another way we can incubate dreams for health and, and to really trust our spirit. But maybe another little bit of a disclaimer that I began this work seriously in 2004, 2005. And that so by the time I got diagnosed in 2019, I had a very strong relationship with my dream life. And that's why I felt I could trust it to guide my medical decisions. That also came up in my dissertation, women using their announcing dreams to guide medical decisions based on whether they do amniocentesis, whether they do a home birth, whether, you know, all, all kinds of different things. So related to that type of wellness and medical care. So I had oof, about 15 years of dream practice to 
convince me that this was my greatest guide and that my own inner physician in my own consciousness would show up to help me. So with that said, the disclaimer would be, if you're just starting this, really use all of your faculties, all of your intellect, huge second and third opinions from physicians to guide you. Um, because not only did I do that, but I, I still think that if this is a new brand new practice that we want to be wise and, you know, wise and intelligent about how we choose our, our medicine, if you, if you will. Yeah. Oh, but that makes sense. Is that, is that it totally kind of does. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. That's really oh. interesting. And I got motivated. I'm going to do that tonight. I'm going to start doing it. Um, so yeah, yeah. I have, awesome. okay. So I have questions. Um, sometimes a dream, like I have this recurring dream. I mean, it's like every night it's the same dream where I realize I forgot to like empty out my dorm room in college. And I like trying to figure out where do I live? Where am I going? Oh my gosh, I left all my stuff there and I never picked it up. Or there's like that feeling of, oh no, I'm still in, co I have to be in college again because I never graduated. And that is literally every single night I have that dream. And my sister has the same dream, which is really interesting. Wow. Um, so sometimes they're just murky like that, where I'm just in this repetitive packing thing of like packing things up. But then I often lucid dream. And uh, I had one the other day where nothing was happening. It was just, I was, everything was 10 times clearer and crisper and more colorful than a normal dream. And I was very aware that I was dreaming. And I, I looked at these flowers and I was just going up and going, wow, look at the, I can see every little detail in the flower. I can see all the little, every little molecule. And so I just thought, let's have some fun. And I was just walking around going, at that mountain look at this thing it's so real I, and then I started to feel myself coming back into my body and I was like oh, I'm and then I woke up and I was like oh I think I'm leaving now but I can when I'm in it I know I'm in it and I'm like let's do let's like take advantage of that so what is yeah. it that contributes to lucid dreaming and and from your perspective what is lucid dreaming okay and I have, I have some questions for you yeah I do love though how you in in the lucid state you were looking at something from the natural world. Yeah, me too. We just seen it it's so so you know so deeply. Um so lucid dreaming is being aware that we're dreaming while we're dreaming. And we can really enhance those qualities at least in my experience through uh, meditation. But both eastern and western science and philosophy have a lot to say about how to cultivate or grow our lucid dreaming skills. So um, we can look at writings uh, from Tibetan Buddhism. We can, uh, you know, in dream yoga, we can look at writings from, you know, uh, authors here that are uh, really great lucid dreamers uh, in the United States, like Robert Wagner, for example, um, also Robert Moss. Um, Stephen LaBerge, uh, Ed Kellogg. There's there's so many, so many people. Um, if you're in Europe, look into Claire Johnson's work. And we can learn about these people, I think are wonderful teachers for uh, learning skills to dream in these ways. Also Amina Mara here in the United States. And if you're in Australia, look into Melissa Johnson. I mean, there's just so many really skilled people that um, can help us. Um, if if you're in Hawaii or California, you know, <laughs> look me up um, where we can really explore this realm. So something to always remember um, is that from my own experience and also Ed Kellogg got me to think about this is the spectrum of lucidity. So we can have some awareness, like so lucidity, lucidity, let me just back up and say, isn't just an on and off switch. Okay. We can be lucid in a spectrum. So from some awareness that we're dreaming while we're dreaming, you know, in the dream to something even really hyper lucid. So the question I would have for you is that if you had, 
enough lucidity, I was going to ask you, did you consider asking the dream? Dream, what do I need to know about this college situation? Because you said oh, it's a competitive dream. Yeah. So it, it's it's wanting to get your your attention. And I'm wondering if there's something left back at college for you or you know, yeah. what, about identity or, or, or things like that. Cause you're, you said you lose belongings or orientation about where you should be in your mm -hmm. life. So, so, um, a, a dream incubation could possibly be oh, yeah. dream. Show me what I need to know about this repetitive college dream or, or however you frame it according to your, your experience. And if you're lucid, do what you would do in the dream incubation before you fell asleep. Yeah. I'm never Which lucid in the, in know. the college dreams. It's always like, Oh, I'm uh -huh. stuck here. And why am I 50 years old and I'm still in college? And, you know, it's like that feeling of, but I left here and I put that behind me. Why am I still here? So uh, not behind you, you go there and your, your spirit goes there. When you yes. Sleep. And the other one that is almost every night is that, you know, I mean, I would tell you, I, I got to say every night is that I lose my car in a parking lot. I can never find my car. It's, it's always in some huge lot and I forget where it is, or I get to the car and it's been completely dismantled and somebody has taken it apart. And then I have to go down to the tow place. And mm -hmm. every single time I go there, I'm like, this has happened to me five times already, you guys. Why does my car keep being taken and dismantled? And it's like this constant frustration of not being able to find my car. Yeah, that's really frustrating. I'm like, why? Yeah. <laughs> why? Well, we know it is um, someone who lucid dreams already, you already have skill and knowledge there. And by increasing meditation practices every day, yeah. those lucid dream skills uh, for a lot of people become enhanced. And then I'm wondering if you can use your lucid dream skills to then directly ask the dream. Yeah. You know, um, so, and, and we, as we know, dreams can, we can ask the dream to transport us. So while I've never been to Egypt or the Giza plateau in this physical waking body, as I hope to someday, I've been to it a few times in my dream body. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can ask to be transported or directly fly ourselves there, or just say dream, you know, show me a new scene about college. What do I need to know? Or there's so many ways to frame it. Um, there's so many ways to frame it, keeping it simple, straightforward, direct, positive, affirmative, going directly to what we would like to understand or what, you know, um, dream, remembering the college situation. What do I need to know about this? Yeah. And see what you might, you know, be Ooh, shown. I'm going to do that. I'm going to try it. If I can get myself out of the dreaming and into, oh, wait, this is a dream, which mm -hmm. a lot of times when I have a lucid one. I start to think, oh my gosh, I can do whatever I want. And a lot of times it involves, I am going to eat all, I'm going to go to this bakery and eat all mm -hmm. the cupcakes and just eat and eat and eat and eat. And it doesn't matter. And so like, sometimes I'll have fun with it where I literally just eat sugar, like eat just like massive uh -huh. amounts of, of delicious food. Um, because, <laughs> yeah. Cause it's like, uh, yeah. I mean, maybe cause in real life I don't eat sugar. So it's like this um, thing, but yeah. so talking about lucid dreaming as it pertains to visitation, because I'm a medium and a lot of people ask me, I get text messages pretty regularly saying, I had this dream about my loved ones in spirit. Was it a visitation or what does it mean? And, um, I'll start just by saying how I respond, but I'd like to know everything, you know, about visitations, because I've only had one in my life. Okay. And, um, it was, what I say is it's usually, the difference is when you're dreaming, like you might dream of your loved one and you're like at a carnival and there's a blue elephant. And then, you know, like all these weird things are happening and you're in line for some concert. A visitation is so much more, at least in my experience, more simple. It is a lucid, lucid dream. It is so real that I knew when it was happening that it was real. And I... It, nothing was happening. It was just, I don't even know where I was. I was just somewhere. And then my grandfather appeared mm -hmm. and he was, he passed when he was 80, but when he came to me, he was like 45 mm -hmm. and he just looked so good. And I went up to him 
and I put his face in my hands and I said, Grandpa, you look so good. And I said, I can see every pore and every whisker. And I said, this is so real. I miss you. I love you. And he didn't say a word. He just smiled, which he was a quiet guy. So yeah. that he, he really wasn't a big talker. He just smiled and he just hugged me. And mm -hmm. my grandma was there, but she was just sitting on the side. It was a feeling. It was, this is so real. I know this is my grandpa. And I could feel his love. And I woke up, went about my day. And then halfway through the day, I looked at the calendar. It was his birthday. Oh, I had, he'd been gone 11 years. So I wasn't really, we don't, you know, we don't always mention it. Um, but I just realized, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. He came on his birthday. That's beautiful. It was, and it was amazing. And I, I just, and I know it was real. There's no, I haven't had anything like that where it was just that. And then I woke up and it was just that simple. A lot of times they'll just say, I'm okay. Or they'll mm -hmm. just hug you or they'll just smile or they'll just stroke your face and that's it. Mm -hmm. So tell me what you, tell me everything about visitation dreams. Um, such a favorite topic of mine. So um, maybe I should just start for your listeners who may be having visitations around uh, maybe shortly after someone's death, if they're actively grieving, um, I would look into Joshua Black and his work on grief dreams. They do involve, you know, the deceased uh, spirit, you know, being present in the dream and he's in Canada. And so I would look into his work because sometimes the question comes up about what's going on within us too, for when these deceased loved ones come back. Now I let's talk in this conversation about deceased loved ones, because, um, there are I'll acknowledge that some for some people visitation dreams are scary for some people a deceased loved one comes back and behaves scary or it's someone who's deceased but not a loved one and so that i think is really in a different maybe basket let's say and so i, I can't address that too much because in my own um in in what i've learned and then also in my experience it's been very loving only one time. And, and I've had many, many, many visitation dreams. Mm -hmm. So only one time did I suspect the deceased loved one who's very important to me. Did I suspect she wasn't who she was? That's only happened one time. And I, I think, I believe I left the scene. I'd have to look back in my dream dictionary to get um, all the details. Cause this was maybe seven years ago or something like that. It was a long time ago. Only once have I suspected this isn't who it appears to be. So a psychologist um, named Mary Delaney, I, I'm not sure if she's in practice anymore, but she was someone I worked with in uh, Arizona for uh, about two and a half years. And she always told me in whether it was dreams or uh, waking state, hy hypnotic trances, journeying, whatever we are doing, <laughs> um, to look at the hands and feet. And we can even ask, reveal yourself, who are you? Just to be sure it's a good spirit and that no one's in a disguise. So that's all I can really say about that. That's not an area of expertise, but I can just share those points about whether you're in grief and about whether you suspect, you know, the person to not be who they are and uh, whether you believe there's some dark attention or malintention or whatever it is. Um, so that that could be addressed elsewhere by maybe people who practice a different kind of dream art than I do, or may have more knowledge in that. But in my personal experience, what is really common are, are the deceased loved ones on my father's side of the family reappearing and offering uh, guidance, assurance, visits, or just having a happy time together. Um, now of those, when they come back in the dream, they're looking great. It's only one of them uh, that I've had concern about because I think he died in fear and distress. And when he shows up in my dreams, the sense I get is he's maybe stuck because he's kind of acting out some of those behaviors in the dream. 
where when his deceased wife shows up in the dream, she's having the time of her life. Um, so along with everyone else, uh, my dad's family, uh, you go back a generation or two and it's, it's pretty large. So I have great, great aunts and uncles that show up, um, uh, gra my grandmother's cousins, you know, people that have been deceased for a long time. So sometimes when, you know, I've heard other, other researchers say, oh, that's a grief dream. And I'm like, no, I don't really think so. My grief's pretty resolved. These people died, you know, uh, 20 to 30 years ago, some of them. Yeah. Um, so I don't really believe it's a grief dream. And my spirituality tells me that we're still connected. So maybe I could tell you about something I'd love to do. So if any of your listeners wants to uh, bring me in for a workshop, <laughs> I want to tell you about my favorite workshop that I love to do that involves dream incubation, shrine or, or altar making and visitation dreams. Um, or I can go into that now, but maybe you have questions or want to want to share anything. Just one thing. And then I then let's go right into that. Thank you for bringing that up. I would say, again, I don't know. I personally don't have experience with dark entities or anything like that. I know that plenty of people in my realm do understand more about that. Uh, so I really don't, again, I, I haven't experienced it, so I'm not equipped to speak to it. But mm -hmm. I will say that the other day, and, and it isn't that, but my friend reached out because her uncle had just died and her cousin wanted to know, she said, I'm having dreams that my loved ones in spirit i can't remember how she said it but it's like they're be they're in some kind of a container or like a a grid or something and i can't see them or touch them and i'm reaching out and they're not seeing me and i can't get to them and i said no i can't say only you know if it felt real but to me that possibly without only you know, right? If it, how real it feels. But I said, I think that feels to me more like a reflection of grief in where are they? I can't get to them. Like feeling because he just, her dad just died this last week or whatever. Ooh. And so it's like yeah. that grief of, I just want to see yeah. them and know they're there. And so I felt like it's probably not a visitation because if it were visitation, it would be there to comfort you. It wouldn't cause you distress. Um, that's just my opinion and my experience but it i doesn't mean that i'm right it just it's just sort of something i have felt to be true we is, can only go on our experience right exactly and, and if not you know direct to others jean von bronkhorst is another person in canada who's written about dreams and dying and things like that too so maybe this person may want to look into uh the the publications of jean von bronkhorst who was a hospice clinical social worker or again or from a more research perspective joshua black who researches grief dreams especially when the death is so current yeah the grief is heavy um yeah so it's 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 hard to say because our culture and our history and background belief system, all of this informs what we perceive. Mm -hmm. And that's so important, you know, to, to remember. And, um, you know, you know, some, for example, some people say, oh, well, the, the, the darkness scares me, but in my experience, um, you know, we know dreams come from, you know, some say the black dream world. And that the blackness is the source of creation. That is the ultimate beauty. The ultimate creative force is the darkness, is the blackness. And we can go into the black void. For some, that's scary. For for me, I haven't had a lot of experiences there, just a few. But um, each time, it's a it's in a place of incredible peace and stillness. Um, and I, I I'm able to usually get there if I start to have a lucid dream and then meditate in the lucid dream, mm -hmm. either with a vocal toning uh, uh, sound. Uh, I have the experience meditating with uh, the vowels, ah, a, e, o, u, and getting those vibrations or just being in, in um, uh, 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 you know, sitting into, uh, you know, uh, legs crossed or some position and that can propel me there too. Um, so, yeah. So for some, the, when they have more experience in that blackness, it can be a pure pl p place of peace and love and the beginning of creation. You know, that's what we all come from is the blackness, but, but, um, for others, it's frightening. 
Yeah. And so all of this just brings up questions. And, you know, every time I talk about this, whether it's, you know, in a session with, with uh, therapy clients or on a podcast or in presentations, it's just these, the, we, we leave with more questions <laughs> yeah. than we have answered. So um, it is something that, again, we can ask, we can incubate a dream with a question about it, try to use um, our lucid dream skills to give us that space to ask, again, a question uh, about, about it, you know, um, when can I, when can I touch, you know, my deceased so-and-so loved one, uh, when will I be able to speak with them or communicate with them? Different traditions and cultures talk about the times post-death of when we can meet, when, when the spirit's busy, let's just say yeah. <laughs> they're more accessible. Um, also, we don't know how, let's say we're looking at it from Tibetan uh, Buddhist philosophy how, how, and religion. How are they navigating the bardo? You know, um, like I said, my, um, and I could just name them. My, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather appears to be stuck when I see him. Stuck is just my perception of it. Yeah. Um, where my grandmother does not. She's having a good time, you know, and, and, um, yeah, it, we, you know, we, we it's it's hard to know. We'll we'll know after death, but I think that's where where we met the International Association for Near Death Studies, the annual conference um, that just happened. Experiencers tell us what it is like post death, post the body shutting down. And what I was really struck was um, how long some of the death experiences lasted. Uh, meaning by this, I mean, um, people who've been underwater for 30 mm -hmm. minutes, you know, knocked out, um, kayaking accidents, getting trapped under rocks. Um, another Vinnie Tolman, uh, Vinnie Tolman was dead for 47 minutes. Yes. And, and, um, the man who, um, had the, um, accidental overdose, he was an athlete. I think it was a, a, a performance, uh, maybe athletic. Yes. Accident. Right. He I was interviewed body oh, that, that was they, him. They body that was Vinny. Vinny. Yeah, that's Vinny. Yes, they drove yeah. him away uh, in the ambulance. Yeah. So uh, people who've been uh, in avalanches buried under snow for much longer than right. So we 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 know these people. <laughs> We've yeah. met these people. We've talked to these people. Um yeah. Um was it also just to 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 go on another uh, train of thought real quick? Yeah. Was it also Vini that said I'd have to look at my notes that said Earth School is the hardest to get into and the hardest to graduate from? Was it him? What? I don't remember. I, I know have, it's. I know. I know it might be. Oh, his is the one of my favorite interviews that I ever did. Um, it's just a few episodes back, but it's one of the most in in depth and believable because it incorporated all of the things that I personally have, uh, all of the knowledge that I've incorporated for myself and made sense of all of these different stories and somehow things start to come together. And when he told his story, I just went, oh my God, it, it literally incorporated every single thing that I've, I'm starting to understand. So it really resonated with me personally um, in terms of that totally makes sense, as wild as it sounds, that this is what's happening. And it is very much like the movie Defending Your Life with Albert Brooks and Meryl Streep, which is a little dated, but it is that they go to the other side and it's kind of how they go to school and they get on the bus when they get there and they go to the next route. And it, it feels very institutional for something that's supposed to be so ethereal. And yet there is some kind of an institutional aspect to what goes on on the other side that sounds wild, but isn't life wild? Isn't this world wild? Why do we question that that could actually be the case? So it's fascinating. And same me, I, dreams are fascinating because what's always fascinated me about them is how you are experiencing things in life. And you're, I always thought of it as your brain is creating stories out of these themes. So, um, but now I wonder if it isn't our higher self because it's so intricate. So 
the symbology of dreams. Both. I think I, that's I, so true. I, yeah, I, I think it's really all all and everything. It's it's both. You know, yeah. we can be processing daily residue. You know, dreams help with memory consolidation. They they help with us perceiving you know future threats, survival, and evolutionary aspects. There's so many reasons we dream. Um, uh, but the more we become conscious in the dream and of all of all of that kind of altered state space, we can do personal investigations and start to differentiate or distinguish between when are we just having a dream where we're kind of processing things we need to know for a day-to-day -day reason yeah. or maybe something much higher, you know? Yeah. yeah, that's such an yeah. interesting, it's so interesting how it all plays out so perfectly. And it'll be like, oh, I had a dream where these things happen and I met this guy and then we went to some place and then we went to the doctor and then I got sick. And, and when you wake up, you're like, oh, that's because today I had this experience where, and this is how I felt. So it's the same things aren't happening in the dreams, but the things that are happening are evoking the exact same emotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what's so interesting to me is how did I create this made up scenario but that perfectly reflects the themes of what I'm actually experiencing and the emotions that are coming up for me around that dreams um are I think just can be our biggest helpers yeah. if we if we learn the language of them let's say and so I always say that and, and many many of us dream workers say throw out the dream dictionary build your own yeah and that takes time and practice because you can build your own through having a dream journal and then start to see those repetitive patterns and images uh come come through right so a dream dictionary isn't going to do you any good if you have if you're saying i'm going to look up what a black cat means Mm -hmm. A black cat for me is not yeah. a black cat for you or a snake for me isn't a snake for you or, you know, we need to build our own and yeah. And so that I'll just stick with that point. We we need to make our own dream dictionary. I was going to ask you about that too, because I, I don't subscribe to a shark means this, a cat means this. I think there, it can be. And then also it's more important to pay attention to the emotions that are coming up for you. Yes. Yes. Um, like one of my recurring dreams is that I go to Hawaii and I'm excited to be there, but I never quite get to experience it because my family go, we all go there as a family, but then no one wants to leave the hotel. And I'm like, come on, let's go do stuff. And then I walk, I say, well, I'm going to, before we leave, go down to the ocean because that's why we're here, isn't it? And then I get to the ocean and it's filled with sharks and I'm like, huh? oh, can't go in. So obviously that's pretty obvious. Like there's something about holding, I feel held back from fully going into the ocean or like getting to fully immerse myself in these experiences that I want to have. Like there's some block to me just mm. being able to swim in the ocean and enjoy myself because there's this threat always like, and every time I have my dream about Hawaii, it's I can't go in there. There's sharks and there's always sharks. I can mm. see them and they're swarming. And I, and so there's something, yeah, that's like a block, but um, the, so, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so a shark, for for you you just kind of shared what it yeah. means in hawaii shark is an ancestor uh most uh my understanding is most of the the um animals of the ocean are you know the the turtle the stingray the the shark and um more but if one is let's say from where i'm from where you're from and maybe even where i'm from which is originally the um red triangle of california off the coast yeah. right where all the great whites are um while i've surfed there i also know that a great white might take me out even though sure. yeah it's very, it's very low driving is more dangerous than surfing with great whites but still so there's that threat but if i had let's say um been born and lived and raised in hawaii as a native hawaiian person then that might have a very different meaning perhaps it might even mean to enter the water I, I can't say right. for sure, but um, 
culture and our history is so important in our dream interpretation, you know, and um now that we said ancestors, I'm thinking about the whole shrine, shrine making. If, if oh, you... yes. Go into that. And, and that'll, yeah. And then we, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, um, so I am a, a board member and the ethics chair um, uh, or the, the chair of the ethics committee and board member of the International Association for the Study of Dreams. And so I um, am very involved with that organization and I present at most of the conferences and one of my favorite things to do to present, whether it's at the annual or regional, which I which I've done this uh, shrine making workshop before, and also private ones. So I, I love to do more, more of these is to offer workshops where we talk about visitation dreams, build shrines or altar spaces to uh either one or a group of deceased loved ones and then talk about how we can use dream incubation to begin to build a dual directional or almost a feedback loop between um the 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 shriner altar space and i'm going to use those words interchangeably for now mm -hmm. but the shriner altar space and the dream incubation practice um and so what i mean by that is um and i shout out to my father who hand builds wooden shriner altar boxes for every participant so when i give them to each workshop participant they're hand built by my father so i just want to uh, shout out to my dad and thank him so much for um for making these and we're ready for the next workshop, by the way. I, I think he's made me, I have another set of 30 or 40 waiting. So what I do is I bring, I, I, I bring those to this work, the workshops with all the paints and decor and hot glue guns and, you know, scissors and all and the fabric and all the things. And we first, of course, you know, thank call in and thank the, the ancestors and the deceased loved ones we are there to honor. We talk about visitation dreams, you know, what maybe some people share ones they've had, but sometimes the workshop is actually dominated by people who have not had a visitation dream. And so the workshop is equally important. And, and I'll tell you why. So we build this dedication, the shrine space or altar space to the deceased loved one or, or many loved ones in, in a family line. And then we um, also talk about dream incubation. So how this is in the home is at the end of the workshop, people learn about dream incubation and visitation dreams, especially if it's new for them. They leave with this beautiful altar or shrine they've made. They put it in a special place in their home and it can be covered or not. So, you know, there's a whole philosophy around or thoughts around opening and closing spaces. We discussed that too. And then this is our sacred space for those loved ones. So we can operate in two different directions. One direction is we go to the space before bed, pray, give thanks to that deceased loved one and ask, begin the dream incubation practice right there, asking for them to show up in some way. Go to sleep, see who appears and do that practice for a week or two. See if they come through. And then go back to the dream space, thank or ask again, <laughs> or thank them by a way I've done it. For example, an, a, one of my first visitation dreams involved my Noni or my grandmother's cousin, we called her Noni, who brought me a, a rose. And so I got a rose and put it in at the altar. So that's one direction, right? Another direction, uh, again, it's like a feedback loop and keeps going either way, is to... Um, have uh, just some some visitation dreams already and then set up the, the shrine to not only that honor that deceased loved one, but then show within the shrine maybe objects or things or letters, poems, anything that you can do to honor them from the dreams you've already have and keep that going in that direction. So you can start with the ask or you can start with the experience already and still build this beautiful shrine or altar space where you can kind of keep that dual directional uh, space going and, and use the space and the bed, the dream 
uh, incubation practice in the dreaming state itself, lucid or not, as a kind of feedback loop or, you know, a, a practice, let's just say. It becomes yeah. practice that you can do for your entire, entire life. So we can use the space to leave letters, offerings, food, we, you know, we can open and close the space. I'm, I'm the type that leaves it open because uh, most often the altars have been in uh, the kitchen or near the kitchen because I like to call them in when I cook Italian food. You know, they were um, Italian American or some Italian immigrant, you know, just came, came over uh, off the boat. So I'll wear, you know, maybe their aprons, use the, um, I'm lucky to have a, um, one of their spoons, wooden spoons, aprons. Of course, that uh, the women of that time did lots of, of needlework, whether it was cross stitch or embroidery, have some of their, lucky enough to have some of their, their fabrics and things they made, pillowcases or whatever. That can be part of the dream incubation practice too you know, is to use, you know, maybe you fold up that pillowcase and place it in front of the altar and then open it with your um, request sleep on the pillowcase. Um, so I'm lucky to have those. For people who maybe um, I have family that's been in the foster care system, adopted or fostered, uh, or maybe who didn't get to know at all any family members, we can start to use the dream space and the, the, the altar making space to start investigating that, to start trying to call in more ancestral images, uh, memories and things and have them represented there on, on the, the altar space. So that's how it can, it can be, a, I think it a, of it is a dual directional feedback loop. And yeah. it's one of my favorite favorite workshops to teach or facilitate um, because it's so important to me and it's a practice that I do and have done, you know, for gosh, it might be almost 20 years uh, in that particular way. Wow. So I really so wanted cool. to share that because I thank I you so much for sharing it. that. Yeah. Thank and and yeah, it's so to me, I love it. Of course. And then um, when I know that you'll probably announce what workshops that you'll do, but is, I would assume that's all on your website and following, following you, do you, Some do of it social, is. yeah. So do you Some, do social media? Mm -hmm. Okay. Where yeah, can people on, find you? I'm conscious chimera.com. And I have uh, Dr. Kim's conscious chimera classroom on Substack. I have conscious chimera.com as the website and then um, conscious chimera on Instagram. It's a private page. So you need to make the request and on Facebook, it's my last name first. So Mascaro and then Kim, and that's me on Facebook. But I also have a Conscious Chimera Facebook page, just not as active. So there's many ways to find me, or you can simply even Google my name and I'll come up. So I, um, you're reminding me, I, I need to put probably more about uh, some of these workshops, but I will just say too, I'm, I'm really open to um, invitation, you know, invitations yeah. on this. And as long as I can travel with a, a suitcase because I need it full of the altar boxes, you know, a small suitcase for some clothing and a larger one for the art supplies, the, the wooden shrine boxes and the art supplies, then it's something that I can bring to a group, to a community, whether it's private in someone's, you know, home or community center or to a larger organization. I think the largest group I've done it with is around 25 people at one time, uh, but I have enough boxes. My father's made enough to do up to even 30 or 40 people, but that's probably as much as I'd like for something like this because it's so sacred and so heartfelt yeah. that I really want to hold it in a, in a container. So if it gets bigger than 40, that can get kind of uh, challenging for me personally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kim Mascaro is your last name, but we'll, we'll have the links below. This has been such an interesting conversation and I just appreciate you showing up with your energy and your knowledge and your insights and awesome. making this podcast, contributing to making this podcast what it is. And I, I'm pretty proud of it, um, but I couldn't do it without you. So thank you for showing up.
Thank you so much for having me and also meeting you at IONS was great. And you introduced so me to your podcast because I, I, there's, I didn't know, you know, there's so many, but it's great when you meet the person behind one and can yeah. then really kind of dive in. So, so thank you for all you do and for having me on and um, listening to my story and sharing it with your listeners. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks again, Kim. Bye for now. Bye.